Uh, we had a series of pearls without a string. Uh, that is uh, excellent talks, but not a little wrap up. Uh, and so uh, for this uh, year, we decided to add this panel. And had Dr. Snyder been here, he would be up here. Had uh, Clint still been here, he would have been here too. Um, but we'd like to kind of pull together the conference. And in my mind, uh, I wish I could take credit for how well I thought the logic of it flowed. I really can't. It just kind of uh, it was, I got great speakers on topics, but the, the sequence seemed to line up really nicely in the sense that we started by talking about the nature of the profession and what makes you unique as members of a profession uh, endowed with uh, social trust by the society you serve and expected to be uh, autonomous and self-policing. Um, uh, we flowed from that directly into uh, uh, a talk about uh, your, the Constitution and how you should understand your role as agents of, uh, of policies that uh, you yourself don't write, uh, don't design, and in the last session we had a little dialogue about why in the world would you voluntarily submit yourself to that when you're, you know what, going in that your personal values, your personal beliefs can and often, some, at least sometimes, will diverge from the policies that you're serving. Uh, we ended the day yesterday with uh, Clint suggesting that uh, you really need to think a lot about guardrails because uh, uh, senior leaders fail for some fairly predictable reasons. Um, and today we ended up with some of the social science that suggests why that's so, why, uh, uh, why we need to be more reflective about it. So I'd like to start uh, by asking Admiral Carter to reflect on the professionalism part in particular because uh, that conversation is uh, well advanced in the Army thanks to Don's work and then the work of CAPE and the work of General Dempsey. And the Navy is uh, rapidly, I think, beginning to think more explicitly and more deeply about all of that uh, in ways that you're intimately familiar with. So I wonder if you would comment on, on that particular dimension of what we've talked about. Okay, well, good morning again, everyone. Uh, and I know this has been a, a great couple of days and uh, I haven't been able to sit in on all of it, but I've certainly gotten uh, you know, a lot of the key moments and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, most of what I get to talk about when we're in this realm comes from uh, uh, my personal experience. Uh, obviously, I've, I've been in the business a long time. And uh, when it comes to understanding the profession, you know, this reinvigoration, this uh, uh, this renewal that I think we're about to uh, turn the corner on and, and get into. Uh, I, again, I reflect uh, with my opening remarks about uh, my experiences in my first fighter squadron uh, with the Vietnam era folks and how they thought and acted. Uh, and then I go right to my time in my, uh, my first command at the 05 level. And it was a pretty unique experience because uh, we were thrust into uh, a combat situation uh, right away, and it was fairly short notice, and this was the Kosovo conflict. So I, I want to just uh, tender my remarks based on something that uh, for, I don't know what drove me to do this action, uh, but it has to do with the profession. And uh, we had such a short time between when we uh, went into the conflict from when we left Norfolk on the Theodore Roosevelt, this is in the spring of 99, uh, we were the only aircraft carrier that was supporting uh, the combat action. There was a large shore footprint, a large NATO footprint, but we were the only tactical aviation outfit flying from the decks of the Roosevelt. I was a commander of an F-14 squadron, and I had a really young ready room. Uh, 30 aviators, 15 pilots, 15 backseaters. Two of us had actually seen any level of combat at all, and one of them was me. And the other one was the pilot who I was flying most of my major missions with. So the two guys that had the most experience were crewed together. Uh, and I realized on the night before our first mission that that was probably not going to work out so well. And I, don't, I can't say exactly where I came up with this uh, idea, but it has to do with the profession. At what point, and, and many of our discussions has been, at what point do we take our youngest uh, men and women and immerse them completely in the business. And this gets to the most basic thing, and each and every one of you will deal with this dilemma uh, as senior leaders, and that will be, uh, do I play everybody or do I create an A and a B team? You can call it A, B, C, D team. Uh, some people say, well, no, I'm tailoring the right people for every mission. and. 
it occurred to me that nobody could define how long this particular conflict was going to go on. It's a very complicated uh, political combat arena. It was hard for me to stand up in front of my 300 troops and aviators and define to them who the really bad people were in this conflict, to be quite honest. But I decided the night before that I was going to have everybody, and I mean everybody, play evenly. I had no A team, B team, whether it was my ordnance men, my aviators, my mechanics, because this was the profession. And a lot of them came without the experience, and we did have to do a couple balancing acts, but I had no A team and B team. And there were consequences for that. There were gonna be some mistakes made, and I realized that uh, I had to do a little extra work to teach uh, what was right and wrong. And so I immediately brought my training officer and some other folks, and this may sound like a lot of tactical discussion, but there are, there are life lessons in this. Uh, most people get into a battle rhythm or a cycle where you do your teaching, your learning, your sleeping. You know, when you're in combat, you're not doing a lot of other administrative things. But I realized that we had to have a learning session at every day, and everybody had to be the beneficiary of what other people were doing so that we could share the mistakes that were made. Not always, we didn't talk about the good things, we talked about the mistakes we were making, uh, tactically, uh, things in the cockpit, uh, as well as decisions that we were making in the air that had ethical repercussions. You know, where you put your ordinance and you know, were there collateral damage, uh, unintended or intended effects, those types of discussions. We were having in our ready room, and I was doing it at midnight. And that's, that wasn't very popular. And uh, I made everybody check their ego at the door, and I was the one as the commanding officer that would lead off and say, all right, I'm gonna show you the video of what I did that day, and I'm gonna tell you everything I did wrong so that you don't repeat what I did. And it took us about a week to get through a lot of mistakes. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have uh, significant collateral damage issues with the things we were doing. Uh, but after a week, my most junior Lieutenant JGs were now seasoned combat veterans. They all had five to 10 missions under their belt. And consequently, some of my sister squadrons who were playing an A and a B team, they found themselves in a really tough place because they had the people that knew what they were doing and they had a whole bunch of other people that couldn't do in a, lot, a lot of the missions. So, you know, when you look back and you go, where did I feel like I was suddenly a part of the profession? Uh, because of that extreme scenario, I was able to put my most junior people in it and treat them like uh, they were seasoned combat veterans out of the gate. And the benefit of all that to this day is uh, most of those aviators and a lot of those uh, enlisted people, and we're, you know, we're going back now 14 years, they're still serving. They're still in the Navy. Uh, and, and again, I, I wasn't thinking of that then, uh, but they were bought into the fact that I was included in every aspect of the mission, no matter what my grade was, no matter what my rank or experience was, uh, and those people are now leading the profession. Many, uh, I have two of them that are admirals already, and others are commanding officers of carriers, air wing commanders, uh, and I just sit back and I watch them do these amazing things. And I would tell you it's because we threw them into the profession, we guided them, we gave them the tools, and we talked about things that are uh, not comfortable in the ready room. Door was closed, gloves were off, and uh, we talked about what right and wrong was. They heard it. You know, the, the comment that was talked about by the chaplain about how you get people to do the right things on liberty. Uh, we had that conversation too. And I was a product of the era where that was the type of behavior that you saw when you went ashore. And we talked about how people would view us now after these combat actions and how we would talk about what we did and really not talk about what we did so that we didn't walk around thinking we were, you know, uh, more important than somebody else who was doing these significant combat actions. So I think that is uh, things that can be influenced 
uh, by senior leaders and make a big impact. So that's my so, of the profession. To put it in sort of Snyder speak, what, what you described there, I would say, would be several aspects of the sociological definition of profession. You're, you're engaging in self-policing. You're reinforcing a, a shared ethic. Uh, you're signaling that, um, that that's very important to you as the leader. Um, what prepared you to know you needed to do that? Uh, I, I think I learned that because I had seen somebody else not do that. And, uh, and not that I was ever part of the team that didn't get included. I watched another squad do that and I watched the consequences of failure because they didn't get everybody brought in early. Um, I, ha I have to admit I didn't understand the longer range consequences of what I see today. Uh, it would have not occurred to me that the, that would have been a longer range outcome. Uh, but I just, uh, and maybe it, it's part of my own upbringing, uh, coming from uh, the state here, a very small town, where we didn't have enough kids in my high school to have people that only played football or ice hockey. Those same people were in the marching band. Think about that. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, maybe part of it. It would seem to me as, as the Navy is turning to think more explicitly about leader development, it's precisely that kind of lesson learned that would be something that ought to be incorporated explicitly into NFLEX or the, the new flag course or uh, other kinds of, of middle, mid-grade to senior officer development. Uh, you see that happening in any time in, in the future as opposed to the more typical Navy thing of uh, in time technical training for specific jobs? Yeah, I mean, obviously we have the command leadership school uh, we have conferences like this, but uh, it's not as formalized as you would probably like it to be out there. Uh, I know uh, Admiral Kelly's team goes over and talks at the command leadership school level at the 05, 06 level. Uh, I get to address them. I, I bring this topic up with a lot of them. Uh, but where else does it exist? You know, if you're a department head going to your ship, if you're a department head going to an aviation squadron or to a submarine, do you get this discussion? And that's part of why we believe that reinvigorating the profession at all levels, no matter what your designator, you can have these kind of discussions. You can have people tell you, hey, this is some things that have happened in the past and here are some of the outcomes, uh, good, bad, or in the middle. And you can make your own decisions when it's your turn. Um, so I, I think there's some value in that. I think the Army is a number of years ahead of us in having these kind of discussions. Uh, and we in the Navy, are coming to the realization that as maybe our operational tempo may slow down with budget decreases, that we may not get the amount of operational experience in the next 10 years as we've enjoyed maybe in the last 20. Um, so I think there will be a need for that. Uh, another suggestion from previous groups is it would be nice and interesting to have one of your fellow students on the panel. And uh, to that end, I thought I've invited uh, 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 Sean here to join us. Um, Sean was in my elective last term, so I got to know him well, and he also has the added benefit of being a non-U.S. perspective. So um, let me just ask you the open question, Sean. Any immediate thoughts about things you've heard that interested you or struck you as culturally different and worth remarking on? Um, hi. Um, so uh, I think one of the first things that really struck me was, uh, so we got here in... Too close. Okay. All right. uh, I think one of the first things that struck me was uh, we got here at the international program. We got here in July. And I think one of the very first things that we had uh, at the start of the academic year was an ethics conference. And that, I mean, there's no other way to signal emphasis and intent uh, rather than the first thing out of the door was an ethics conference. And I think back in Singapore in our command and stuff college, we, we do have a module a day and a day and a half on that. And we do talk about these issues. But there's nothing quite like a structured sort of program three times a year to really just drive that uh, drive that message home, um, and I think I really appreciated a lot of the a lot of the the presenters that came. I think the thing about ethics is that it can uh, often be very sort of nebulous, uh, very airy fairy, and I think the way that we try to make it very practical for people when you are in that moment of darkness when you are sort of have that Bathsheba moment, uh, can you recognize that? And I think if you can recognize that, and if the image of John Wayne comes to your mind, fine. 
Um, but uh, if you can recognize that, I think half the battle is won. And I thought there was uh, some very practical tips, uh, guardrails, accountability partners, and I think uh, really the key message that um, we shouldn't walk away thinking that it can never happen to us. And uh, I thought these were all very practical lessons uh, we, could all, we could all take away from here. Before I let you off the hook, Sean, uh, uh, Linnell's talk about the Constitution and constitutional ethics was obviously very specific to U.S. culture and, and U.S. forms of governmental organization. Uh, could you give us a little contrast and compare with how this works in, in Singapore? Sure. Um, I think uh, in many ways it's actually very similar. Uh, so we, in Singapore, we operate on a Westminster, so we inherited from the British, a Westminster uh, Parliament system. So. In the executive chain, you have the Prime Minister, the Minister for Defence, and the Chief of Defence, and all uh, the armed forces. And we have a President, who is uh, primarily uh, cus uh, a custodial sort of role. And uh, Singapore, uh, the Constitution of the Singapore Armed Forces says that we would uh, protect and defend the President and the Republic of Singapore, as well as the Constitution. So it actually covers all the bases, pretty much. Uh, so there's the President, the, the, the country, as well as the Constitution. So I think in that sense, uh, I think it's uh, very similar. Uh, a key difference I did, I did notice was, um, in terms of some of the discussions about Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and some of these other issues about testifying, and I think in many ways, um, American society and American armed forces has really sort of progressed away where all these conversations are really taking place right now, and I think it's really interesting to see how this would go. And I think just in my country, uh, we are not quite at the stage where, sort of, in terms of the level of conversation in society, uh, as well as within the armed forces, uh, we are not quite there yet. And I, but I do see the start uh, of these things, and I think in a couple of years we may be facing these very same conversations. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's really good to be to have these discussed here, uh, pressing issues uh, that would could drastically shape the future of armed forces uh, the world over. Uh, discussed at this ethics conference. Um, Anyone on the panel want to offer any reflections on uh, the, the panel we just had, on uh, Dr. Mastriani and, and my dialogue? Uh, any thoughts about how that contributes to the discussion from any of you? Linnell has something to say. I'm amazed. Yeah. Well, one thing I thought was interesting, your, your talk about cognitive dissonance and how we have, and how the scope and of our profession has changed in terms of what types of operations were involved. Uh, we have, have moved from uh, simply being and in, in executing direct conflict to being much more involved in stability operations and, and so forth. And that mental change of just thinking about, well, that's the enemy, and, and that cognitive dissonance of being almost able or, pr or promoting that sort of us versus them. And now we enter into warfare with the expectation that at the end of the day, we need to uh, fix the mess uh, that we that we created and this idea of stability operations and, and how that changes that sort of role or that mindset that we need to be going into with our with our folks um, and in both the the verbal and the actions um, that that coin realm that that you were discussed was something really fascinating um, as, as you spoke and I appreciate it yeah you know, in light of that I think uh George, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about this. I mean, taking up Linnell's point that if you're engaged in counterinsurgency or stability operations, obviously uh, the relationship with, uh, with the people is a fundamental uh, strategic goal. Uh, nevertheless, we put you in an environment where you're experiencing being shot at and IEDs exploding and people taking shots at you on a regular basis. I mean, um, tell me a little about the psychology of maintaining the counterinsurgency mindset under that kind of stress? Well, um, I think I'll state the obvious point, which is that it's very challenging to do so. Um, that uh, we, especially with the all-volunteer force, I think emphasize force protection you know, as, a, as, a key, um, as a key tenet in our leadership posture. And I remember several years ago when I was at West Point, um, some of the people at West Point were saying that um, officers were going to Iraq um, with the stated goal that they would come back with all their soldiers and that they would consider themselves leadership failures if they had any casualties at all. Um, 
That, I think, is, a, is an attitude that is different than, um, than perhaps existed in the past. And in a counterinsurgency situation, um, the goal of complete force protection is obviously in direct conflict with um, some of the operational requirements of getting out among the population um, and engaging in the kinds of activities that will build um, stronger relationships with people uh, in the country. So, um, and when, when you combine that with the, you know, the melting into the populace, you know, um, not wearing uniforms, uh, purposely hiding among people who are innocent um, in order to promote um, and provoke responses that will further complicate your goals. Um, it's just very challenging when um, comrades, you know, are, are uh, killed um, or wounded to maintain the right ethical posture. And that, I think, it speaks directly to the role of leaders, um, you know, where leaders um, establish, uh, reinforce, refine um, values, and then um, model them and continue uh, throughout um, you know, the relationship with the unit to ensure um, that, that those values are being acted upon. And, 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 but I think it's, it's just extremely challenging. Psychologically, um, it, you know, there are, um, I had the opportunity to interview about 150 soldiers early in the war in 2005 from Fort Carson who had come back from Iraq and listening to the stories that they told, I mean, it was just devastating, you know, to hear um, the experiences that they had had um, and the frustration that they felt, um, the anger, and yet um, the inability to these, at that time, you know, the Army still, I think, wants to be um, a World War II Army. You know, we want, we want to fight a tank battle somewhere. Um, and it's difficult culturally, you know, to accept the idea that we, we cannot apply you know, uh, overwhelming combat power to protect ourselves and solve our problems. Um, and I think that, that that cultural frustration, you know, trickles down to the individual soldier and, yeah. and demands a great deal in terms of leadership. One of those CAPE uh, video games I mentioned, uh, it's called a high, high Ground, I believe. Uh, one of the first decisions, you, if you play the role of the lieutenant, you get to pick what, which role you play. If you play the role of the lieutenant, one of the first things that happens in the game is he's walking through the motor pool and he hears his uh, first sergeant say to the, the unit, we're gonna bring all you guys home. And one of his first decision points is, does he stop and say, no, we're gonna try to do that, but you know, mission accomplishment is really the goal. I, I deliberate, well, the first time I played it, I played it knowing it was the wrong answer, just letting it go, just to see where it would go. And where it, where it ends is the sergeant ends up lighting up a house and killing kids uh, at the end of the game and then walks out with the, the dead kid in his arms. Um, so it's, it's pretty powerful. By the way, the rules of engagement here, if anybody wants to comment uh, on anything anybody says, please do, sir. Yeah, I'd like to make a, a comment here, and it goes back to some of the comments that were made previously by, by the doctor. Um, and, it, and it gets back to uh, your discussion about PTSD and, and where that was not considered uh, either a syndrome or a malady, uh, you know, 20 plus years ago and where we are today. And I. We are still evolving. I mean, uh, the last 12 years of war have taught us a lot about uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, what it is, maybe what it isn't. Uh, we've seen it uh, borne out in uh, the complex uh, issue of suicide, suicide-related behaviors, uh, and we're still learning. We're still evolving. Um, and what we are learning, and I think all of the services have embraced this now, is uh, that to be really fit, totally fit, involves so much more than just going to the gym. Just being physically fit is a very small aspect of what it takes to be fit in today's complex world. And I think these uh, unusual combat scenarios and the environment that we operate in now is teaching that. Um, and there's a lot of soul searching going on in all of our services. I mean, we went from suicide being something that we've known about for many years, uh, not really understanding it, to now, over the last few years, it's elevated. It's the number one cause of death uh, as a service member. Now, obviously, the Army numbers are higher than the other services, but none of the services are immune from it. Um, now, of course, we haven't solved this, but it has caused us to take a, a very introspective look towards it, and it does 
have relevance in all of the discussion we're having because it gets into understanding human behavior. And all the, as I said, all the services are now recognizing that it's a multifaceted person that's truly fit, meaning that you know, there is a physical fitness aspect. Think about how much money we all spend on having fitness facilities, whether you're at sea or shore or anywhere. And then maybe how much money we don't spend on embedding mental health professionals, uh, not only with our combat units, but those who have returned from combat and the need for that. Uh, but there are other aspects too. Um, there's a social fitness or an emotional fitness, if you will. Uh, and in today's world, we can't uh, deny that. We were talking about the video gaming piece. It's connected. Uh, I agree with you that there's no evidence to prove, but there is some impact to it, and it can be very positive, very negative. It can also be, um, uh, it, it can uh, attract young people to get into it to where they, they just can't stop playing those games. Uh, they, they get addicted to them, and that can't be really good behavior. And then there's a religious aspect, and it's one that we don't talk about very much. Um, and it doesn't matter whether, which type of God you believe in or whether you don't believe in one at all, there has to be uh, a fitness, a spiritual fitness part that people are allowed to embrace. Um, and it's interesting, we have chaplains. I mean, we were getting into that. I was listening to you talk yesterday and I, and I recognize the Air Force, uh, the Academy has recently taken the so help me God part out of the oath, is that right? Or made it optional? Did the, I? the honor oath. The honor oath, yeah. right. Uh, and that, that disturbs some people. You know, it's an emotional issue. Um, my personal view is uh, it's, it's one that should be understood as maybe an option as to how it should play out. You know, on ships at sea, we still, every night at 2200, have a prayer. Now, there's a lot of people that may think, well, why, you know, this gets into this, are, are you forcing something on people that they shouldn't have to? Uh, and as a captain, I, I would often have this very long conversation with my chaplain to say, I'm not gonna tell you what you can or can't say, but make sure it's non-denominational because we're not gonna uh, try to push one type of religion over another. But uh, this is an uncomfortable conversation that people don't wanna have. And it is part of the total fitness aspect. So the physical, mental, social, emotional, and spiritual are all part of it. And we still have a lot to learn. And many of you here in this audience will become smarter on this and help us evolve this so that uh, we can make our sailors and soldiers, airmen and Marines, that much better. Um, so, so as the Navy's expert on this, um, we're, I don't know if I'd go there. No. What, what, what is the state of play uh, on, on the uh, stigma about seeking mental health support? I mean, I, uh, everywhere I've been, no matter what people were told, they believed that they, there was a stigma for seeking help and there was their security clearances were at risk. Yeah, it, and it's a say-do complex. You know, we're saying that we're gonna reduce the stigma, but until we actually do it, uh, we're gonna still deal with it. So if you're a nuclear operator uh, or you have very high uh, clearance and you are um, uh, diagnosed as having a significant mental health issue, you run that risk. And until we figure out what things are treatable and do not pose a risk to your security clearance, we're, we're, I would tell you we're not there yet. Okay. Lynn, you want to come on as a lawyer Any, on the legal aspects of that, the seeking of mental health uh, services? Well, it's a, it's a fascinating thing that I know my commanders struggle with every day. And this, this relationship between privacy, HIPAA, uh, versus their need to know as a commander. And, and, and they, they really struggle uh, because as a, as a commander, they, they, need, they want to know, they need to know for the good order and discipline of their unit if they have an individual uh, who is, is, is suffering from some sort of mental health issue um, where maybe they need to pull them out of a situation or change the environment in which they're operating. And yet we also have the, the protection of the individual and the privacy interests and our mental health community that's, that's being very guarded ab about that information. And it, it's posing a lot of tension um, in the field. Uh, and, 
and while on one hand, from an individual perspective, we want to promote, okay, you can go and seek this help without implications to your career, and it's hard for us to say that, we're on the same hand saying, yes, but this information is going to get to your command. Um, but I, I certainly also, in being the advisor to command, uh, hear and feel their frustrations um, with this tension of saying, but I, I need to know in order for the effective operation of my unit. And it's that triangle, that puzzle, um, that is a, there's not a good answer because there's no one answer uh, for, for getting there. Sean, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead uh, if I could just follow up on one thing that Admiral Carter said. Um, thinking about suicide for a moment, there, I, there's many people have the misconception that um, suicide rates in the military are closely connected to um, combat exposure and deployment. Um, and that turns out to not be so true. Um, you know, the, we in the Army at least have significantly reduced deployments, combat operations in the last few years, but our suicide rate went from 10 per 100,000 in the year 2000 to now it hovers around 22 per 100,000. It's actually stayed the same and even gone up a little since um, the Iraq War ended. Um, and, and the rates in the Marine Corps have increased significantly as well, and in the other services to a certain degree. And I think it does go back to what Mar Martin mentioned earlier, which is you know, sort of the overall effects on military culture of the last 12 years and how that has changed um, what I think is an important, um, an important objective that we have in the military, which is to make meaning of what we do. Um, soldiers, I think, nowadays uh, struggle to understand the meaning of what they have sacrificed and what their friends have sacrificed over the last decade or so. And looking forward to an era in which the budgets are going to be drastically cut, um, people are going to be separated from the military at high rates and thrown back into civil society. Um, I think, you know, American um, military history is such that people want to believe that they were part of something significant and important and meaningful. And, and that task is more difficult now than it once was. And I think it's a significant role that leaders um, play in helping people to, um, to make meaning and make sense of their own experience. And, um, I, th and I think that's a real challenge today too. But in, I think honestly that until the sort of cultural um, issues uh, in the military are solved, we're gonna continue to see these high suicide rates um, and it's, it's not because people are being repetitively deployed. It's because they're having trouble um, making sense of the reality that now exists. So, Sean, there are a couple of points I'd like to hear from you um, based on my very limited time in Singapore that have come up already. I mean, one is uh, we've already touched on the sort of uh, religious pluralism and multicultural aspects of American society, and Singapore obviously has that in a, uh, a different version of that in a, in a very strong way, having three large communities of very different ethnicities, very different religious backgrounds, very different cultural roots. Um, so I'd like to say a little about how you address national unity issues, and, and specifically in your military. Um, and then the other thing I noticed is that uh, your leadership materials and the people who design it are almost entirely social scientists, right? A very, a very social scientific orientation. So, uh, for example, I asked to ever talk to the philosophy department at the University of Singapore, and it never occurred to them to do that. Uh, and, uh, and so, and so, so uh, I, I think while I love and respect my social science buddies, I mean, in, in the end, all social scientists will tell you is that most people are average, you know? And uh, uh, it seems to me if you're looking for normative guidance from something, you need more than social science to get you there. So any thoughts about those two? Yeah. I think that's, that was uh, more to comment. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, the first thing, the, the question of a national unity, I think uh, I should explain a bit of the background. Um, Singapore, we have uh, actually a conscription system. So all males above the age of 18 uh, actually do need uh, to uh, sort of enlist in the army and serve for two years. And I think the very nature of that actually uh, changes the whole fabric of sort of the armed forces in, SC, uh, in the Singapore, uh, the armed forces in Singapore. I think you, you don't have an all-volunteer force. You have a core regulars, yes. Uh, but at the same time, you have everyone, everyone in Singapore, all the males in Singapore at least, have that sort of experience. And in many ways, uh, we have found that it actually enhances national unity because that provides a common base. You go to boot camp together, everyone suffers together, and it's a, it's a very defining rite of passage almost. 
And I think you add that to sort of the, the cultural mix in Singapore where you have three very large groups of Chinese, Malays, and Indians and how that all sort of, that two years uh, spent together in uniform really brings uh, all of that together. Uh, but the flip side to that really is um, when we want to try to make, uh, we have same conversations in Singapore about making the armed forces a profession of arms. Uh, how do you be a true professional? And that sometimes makes it very difficult because everyone has gone through that. And experiences vary. Some people have a good time, some people don't. Some people just want to get in and just serve out their two years and be done with it. And despite your best efforts to want to try to make it a professional force, people, who, uh, you have your detractors. People who said, oh, you know, it wasn't all that great and, you know, and this and this happened and so on and so forth. So I think that is really where uh, we see that tension, I think, in terms of really trying to build uh, that experience being a national unity building sort of experience and versus really trying to be a professional force as well. So I think that's uh, sort of the first point. And the second question was about the, the curriculum. Um, I think you hit both of them, actually. We oh, asked okay. about multiculturalism. And, oh, that's great, yeah. yeah. No, that, that was really good. Thanks. Um, Linnell, one of the things that came through, especially from Clint's talk yesterday, is that fear of punishment doesn't seem to be a very effective motivator to good behavior. Um, I've read a couple of the IG reports in the Navy about detachments for cause, and some things that glaring come through there is that every one of them knew what they were doing was wrong. Um, they believed they wouldn't get caught, but, but they knew that it was wrong. They wrongly believed that nobody else knew what was going on, um, and they grossly underestimated the consequences to them if this went badly. Uh, so as a lawyer, thinking about that, if, I mean, if I'm trying to get you, I know you wear many hats and lawyer is only one of them, but um, how can we augment, you know, the talk that Admiral Carter and I heard to the new flags, which is the IG and the JAG telling you all the things that we'll kill you for, um, with something that's, that's actually going to be an effective motivator to behavior? Well, I think one thing is that we need to start thinking about what the word discipline really means. Uh, we use it incorrectly all the time. Uh, we in the Air Force have what's called status of discipline meetings, uh, where all the commanders get together and either on a monthly or a quarterly basis, and they talk about what sort of punishments were handed out um, as a result of Article 15s or who they discharged and why, and et cetera. And they're doing that for purposes of discussing among commanders, remaining consistent, et cetera. Uh, but the fallacy exists in what we even call it. We, we call it a status of discipline. It's a status of undiscipline. It's a status of punishment. Uh, it is a, a, a demonstration of how we have lacked discipline and therefore needed to rein folks back in. A discipline is what we talked about yesterday, especially in Don's presentation, this idea of self-regulation, this idea of doing the right thing because we should. Uh, and so I think if we get back to the real root of what does discipline mean, and, and talking with our, our troops, setting that example, setting those expectations, and then, and then living it, uh, and then talking about punishment as that's just what it is. It's punishment when you show a lack thereof of discipline. So. George, why is it that punishment is so ineffective? I mean, you, you read these stories and you think, these are people who've, who've got, if not at all, and you've got an awful lot. Uh, and once this goes south, they're gonna never probably recover from that loss. I mean, on the face of it, you'd think if we were remotely rational, if we, having seen what happens to other people who get caught in this stuff, you, that would be a deterrent. But it seems to be pretty ineffective. Um, I think, first of all, it's an interesting thing in, in psychology that people who study learning years and years ago, uh, B.F. Skinner and people like him, were convinced that punishment was not an effective way to change behavior. And I think that's largely because Skinner didn't want to use punishment because he didn't want to be seen as an Orwellian behavior manipulator. But one thing that we've learned in psychology is that punishment actually is an extremely effective way to change behavior if it's applied correctly. Um, and so um, there's a fascinating study that was done with pigeons. I won't bore you too long, I promise. But, um, <laughs> A um, study with pigeons where they were punishing pigeons with an electric shock for pecking a key. And it turns out that if you um, start at a low level of punishment, as we often do with humans, and escalate that punishment gradually, the pigeons will learn to tolerate 
an, a very high electric shock. Um, whereas if you started with a moderately higher shock in the first place, the pigeon would never peck the key again. So if you apply uh, a strong and powerful punishment, right when the first transgression occurs, that behavior will stop. That psych we psychologists know that that's true. But what often happens is we apply punishment inappropriately and continue to escalate punishments gradually, which simply teaches people to tolerate punishment, um, which is not the goal. So perhaps what's happening with some of these people is, is that they are getting away with things throughout their career um, and not being punished. And so the inconsistency in consequence and the consequence that's applied for their behavior really is teaching them the wrong thing, which is that you can escape the consequences of certain actions. So what the answer is obviously to not let people get away with anything ever. So Linnell, counselor, uh, if, if that's what we know from what psychology, that you want, you want the first shock to be moderately high, will the legal system allow commanders to do that? Uh, they do at my base. Um, uh -huh. uh, and, and I will say that I have seen two commanders who have taken over similarly sized squadrons who have had similarly uh, similar issues, if you will, with, with lack of discipline, handled them in completely different ways, and within a six month period of time, you can tell. Uh, the one commander who went in and laid out very clear expectations and followed that up with equally clear punishments uh, and was extremely consistent in those, in those applications, his squadron uh, doesn't see me very often um, in terms of coming for additional uh, Article 15s, et cetera. Uh, the other commander took a very different tact uh, he would implement some punishments uh, in one level of severity, uh, other punishments or ignoring um, problems um, because that person was a otherwise good troop. Uh, the troops saw it. And the end result is we still have issues in that particular squadron. Um, and their discipline has remained uh, in, a, in a general disarray. Uh, and so I think that once a, a leader recognizes that and can, can set that tone, that, that first initial shock, if you will, a good order and discipline really does follow. And I'm a true believer in that. Admiral, you want to comment on that from a practical commander's perspective? Yeah, I, I, I agree uh, with that uh, line of thinking. In fact, uh, I had that very question in front of uh, about 45 uh, prospective commanding officers over at Command Leadership School early this morning. Exact question. Uh, and the way the question was framed uh, was, uh, how do you uh, discipline your best, and you can fill in the blank, you know, sailor, pilot, uh, officer of the deck when they have misbehaved to the point where you are worried that they will impact your tactical ability to finish your mission or to execute your mission. Uh, or it has a, uh, an impact because they're a great guy or they're a great gal and they're in this, they're, they're already part of the fabric of your team and to remove them is gonna have some impact. And uh, my advice, and, and, and I have had to practice this uh, in some pretty high profile events in my career, is uh, you have to bring the sledgehammer and you gotta act. And, and it, isn't, it isn't just, I mean, there, there's the right and wrong aspect, make no mistake about that. But there's another aspect here, and, and it's a leadership tool. Because everybody else in the command will know that you're in action, in effect, condoning the behavior. And it gets to your point where you've now, uh, through your inaction, told everyone that this is okay to do. And it will repeat, it will find itself, it will manifest itself, and not just in the person who was let off, but in others to know that this is, uh, this is how things get done in this unit. So uh, it can be very painful, and uh, it gets to the very root of the, the hot topic today about where does the authority for things like sexual assault really reside? Um, and I'm very hopeful that uh, we don't completely undo the commander's authority to administer the right level of punishment, especially early on before they become larger issues, uh, because to me that is the very heart of good order and discipline. Um, now that requires that you have good knowledge of what's going on in your unit, 
that you have uh, facts as best as you can have them, uh, and that you take the appropriate action swiftly because uh, time matters in these events. Um, so yeah, well, I, I think it's a very relevant discussion. One, one extra issue, sir. Um, uh, do you have any comments about the discussion Jordan had briefly about you know, stamping out casual use of language that's inappropriate? Uh, yeah, uh, this, uh, this goes back to a, a task I was doing for our, our chief of naval operations before I came here. Uh, we were trying to advise him on uh, some of the root causes of some of the misbehavior that's going on in our society. And uh, I went to that point. I said, you know, this is, this is not about uh, uh, the worst cases of sexual assault. Uh, we'll, we're going to continue to deal with those, and, and those are criminal acts. I would be much more interested in concentrating on uh, the things that uh, reside in each and every one of us at the conscious and unconscious bias that we have. Because we all came from different places. You know, we all grew up in different regions of the world and, and different communities. And then all of us enter service. And many of us do it at such an age that we're still developing. And some of us bring these biases with us that sometimes are left unchecked. And we carry and we continue to carry them with us. So how do we get to that? Uh, and how do we change culturally what, what we teach our young folks either at boot camp or the service academies or elsewhere, what is uh, the correct behavior for the organization you're gonna join? And it's never steady state. You just don't give somebody a, a, a PowerPoint brief or a lecture. I mean, it's constant work and you have to help police yourselves. Um, it's more than having a swear jar. <laughs> um, and how you teach people that, you know, calling people homos is a joke is, is you just, that, that, those days are, you can't do that. I mean, it wasn't acceptable 10 years ago, but today, you know, you're, you're condoning future behavior that, uh, that will manifest itself in your units and, and have bad consequences. So to me, the whole sexual assault and even harassment, which by the way are disconnected in all of our services, but really are similar problems uh, will not ever be rooted out until we get to the most basic understanding of what uh, biases we carry, the conscious and the unconscious. Uh, and this is a lot of hard work that's gonna have to happen at our most basic schoolhouses and one that we have to continually hit upon as we go through all of our development all along the way, regardless of whether you're going from E1 to E9 or O1 to O10, it doesn't matter. Um, and we need it at every level, including up to the O10 level. So, uh, like I said, I think it's a lot of hard work and it's still something that we're just starting to understand. Sean, I don't want to put you on the spot. No is an okay answer, but would you care to comment on what we've just been talking about from a non-US perspective? Um, right. Well, um, I think these are really, really difficult issues. And I mean, just even though my time serving on the ships, I think I definitely have hurt a uh, certain language, a certain jokes being made, and I've not done anything about it. And I think really just that the awareness that I think as you progress in your career, the more the onus is upon you. And I think we talked about um, the being the stewards of the profession. And I think that really goes to that. And I think one of the things that, uh, just sort of to step away from that a little bit, one of the things that I've really brought in my definitions of is really what it means to be a professional. And I think in many ways before coming here, I thought about it as the first time I could drive a ship by myself, you know, the first time I could fight an air war by myself. And really moving away from the definition of being a professional to away from technical qualifications, the certificate that you get, to really what it means, what does, the, what does that service stand for? And really things like, you know, stamping out some of this uh, loose language, you know, coarse jokes. And I think really that becomes more and more a responsibility as we advance in the career. And I think it's a problem that is not unique to this country, and I think a lot of places, uh, a lot of countries elsewhere uh, would also face that. So. I want to make a, a point to uh, the comments I made, because sometimes when I start saying things like conscious and unconscious bias, I'm starting to get into your world, sir, and I, and I, and I probably shouldn't stay there too long. because I'm. Uh, but it, next time you watch a sporting event on TV, it doesn't matter whether it's football, golf, 
pay attention to the commercials that come on during the break and take this discussion that we're having about conscious and unconscious bias and just take a step back and look at the messaging that's going on. Uh, the minimalization of women, the objectification of women in our commercials. I, 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 I'm reminded of a commercial that I saw watching a golf tournament this summer. And the commercial was, uh, there's a whole bunch of pros, well-known pros that are at the, this uh, kind of like this golf pro shop and they're, and they're in the, um, uh, they're, one of them's heading up the cashier. And this uh, very attractive woman walks into the pro shop. She's in golf gear, and she's asking to, you know, get get some sort of uh, information on a golf club or some lesson. And she's not really getting what she needs from this sort of well-known professional who's at the cash register. And then at the end of the commercial, Lee Trevino walks in, and he says the right thing. And all of a sudden, he's got this very young woman underneath his arm. And he's winking at his fellow professionals as he walks out the door as he has won the prize. And it's just, when you, when you take a step back, it just, it just tells you all of the wrong things that we would want our young people. And, and, you know, but yet we elevate these professionals to think that this is the right kind of behavior that we would expect our people to want to do. And as you look at how we have come across the other social challenges in our military, uh, and I will use uh, the racial divides that we saw in the 60s and how we came through that. And not that we're perfect today, but we have come a long way. What we did have going for us in the military is we had American society wanting to do us do those things too. Even though we were leading that change in the military, uh, we, were, we didn't have American society fighting us on that. When it comes to sexual assault and unconscious bias, we do. We don't have the commercial world helping us. We don't have television programming helping us. It's hurting us. And, and we're not going to turn that around. But you've got to be aware of it. And you've got to understand that uh, what is normal behavior and what our young people and what we are subjected to daily does not line up with the say-do continuum. <laughs> And that's going to be a challenge for us, and it won't go away. A really profound point, I think, sir. All right, let's uh, open it to questions from the audience, please. Uh, quite, feel free to talk about anything we've now talked about or to the, to the speakers, things that they said in their talks earlier that you'd like them to further amplify. Um, please 